out. That's good. That's step one done. First of all, hey, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining my talk. Well, actually, it's not my talk. It's um, Rustam and myself uh, created this talk together. Um, so I thought it'd be good to mention him because he was in part of creating this talk. Um, yeah, a little bit about myself. I don't always find introductions are that important for talks, but I think it's important for this talk. Um, my name is Jethro. I'm originally from South Africa, and I've traveled uh, all over the world. I uh, worked in the US, the UK, Australia, and now also in, in Europe and the Netherlands. Um, and I think that that's relevant for this talk because I've worked in different organizations in different countries that have different uh, cultural differences. Um, and I think the one factor that I've seen that really affects these cultures uh, differently is engineering culture and how there's a unique um, blend of a good culture and a company that transcends cultural differences. And you can be in America or Australia, and when you find a good culture inside of a company that really promotes uh, engineering, uh, it's a great place to work. So that's the commonality there. So let me first of all ask you, um, who here already cares about engineering culture? Just a raise of hands. Oh, that's good. Maybe some people to convert to care about engineering culture. Uh, Next question is, who is actively doing something about it? Well, all right. So uh, I'm sure everyone here has heard of this company called Google. Maybe not. I don't know. But if you, if you have, um, they also decided that uh, maybe culture in a company is very good, uh, specifically engineering culture. And they decided uh, that they wanted to investigate not only tech teams, but they wanted to investigate within inside the organization what makes certain teams successful and what makes other teams not so successful. So they set out a study, uh, I think, of 2,000 different members inside of a team, 400 different teams, basically a really uh, extensive study with inside Google as an organization. Um, and they decided to choose the name Project Aristotle. And I think that that's very fitting, because it mentions uh, his famous quote is, the whole, of, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And I think that that's really relevant uh, with inside of uh, team culture. And engineering culture especially. So this is what Google thought that they would find out. So they said, hey, we want to we create the study. Let's create a hypothesis about what we think will make uh, these teams successful. So they thought, OK, first of all, you just put a few high performers on the team. You add an experienced manager. And you give them a free pass to all resources. So who here thinks that this is probably what they would think about when you think about making a good team? These are probably some of the factors that you've thought about before about inside of your team. Um, and is that, does that ring your bells with anyone? Is there anyone resonating with this? I think for a lot of us, if you haven't really looked into it that deeply from the surface, this is kind of what you would, you would see and expect. So let's see um, who here, raise of hands again, thinks that putting high performers on the team influences the, 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 the team's performance. OK. What about adding an experienced manager? All right, and then what about giving them a free pass to all resources? Well, let's see what, uh, what Google found. Yeah, so which of these factors were not significant? So putting a few hard performers on the team, turns out not so important. Adding an experienced manager also doesn't really have an effect. Uh, giving them a free pass to all resources, it's not necessarily a no, but they found that it was not a significant factor in determining if a team was successful or not. But I think we can all agree that uh, uh, free pass to resources is probably a good idea for most teams because you want to have uh, good information flow inside of your organization. So then let me ask you, maybe again if someone would like to help out because I really like uh, an interactive session where the audience uh, discusses these things with me, which factors do you think are significant for a successful team? Yeah? The environment. The environment. Yeah. What about the environment? Uh, oppressive environment or an empowered environment, an environment where people can make mistakes. So an environment yeah. Where people can fall and value their team. Yeah. That's good to hear. Anyone else? Yeah? The back? Interesting. I haven't heard that one before. Let's see what if that resonates some more. You, you also had a hand raised, yes? Being able to do your job. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so I think that's kind of. Let's see what uh, what Google found to be significant, and I think that maps to what a lot of you guys are already saying. So, Google's significant factors. Number one was uh, psychological safety. I think this is what you were speaking about. Being able to fail, you need to be able to uh, make mistakes, and if 
you feel in a harsh environment where you can't make mistakes, then you won't feel safe. And I think it's important to fail and to make mistakes because that's how you can learn. The next one is dependability. Maybe that's kind of what you were talking about, about knowing each other's skills and what's expected from, from each other. Structure and clarity. I think this one is uh, maybe not said as much as it should be. Uh, it's not as obvious, hey, we should make things really structured and clear for the people on the team to work on, but are you really doing something about that actively? Uh, meaning of work. So I'll just grab some water. Meaning of work. So I think this was... Um, Round about similar to what you were saying, I think a little bit like, is the work that you're working on, does it have meaning to the people that are doing it? So do they come into the office every single day and just do some mundane things, or do they work on things that really have an effect? That would be meaning of work. And then impact of work. So are you really helping someone at the end, so you're building a new feature for an application, or you're deploying something, or whatever the case may be, does that actually affect your end user, or is it just something that's gonna be swept under the rug and no one ever used? So those things are really, really uh, significant. Uh, inside of Google. And the, the commonality here, um, as you can see, is structure, meaning, impact. A lot of it's to do with the work that we, we do and giving value and adding value to what you need to work on uh, is one of the most significant factors that Google found. So I think the last three kind of have a lot of similarity and you could say that's about the, the value of the work that you're doing. So with Google's intense data collection, number crunching, they led to the, the same conclusion that good managers have always known, the best team members listen to one another, show sensitivity to feelings and needs, right? So this has got nothing to do with anything else other than being a decent human being to, to the next person in your team, and I think that that's very valuable. So, this picture, we decided to, to feed it into uh, an AI, as we probably hear a lot more about AI, and you could probably guess it's already an AI-generated image. But if you can look to the right, we have something that's very hard, steel-like, metal, um, maybe uh, something uh, yeah, very strong uh, that doesn't really change a lot. And on the left, you can see culture. And when culture comes in, it makes everything brighter. It doesn't change the structure specifically. It's still a, still a square, but it has a lot of more vibrancy and life uh, inside of it and creates a better place to work. So it's just a, AI is a representation of what culture does to an organization, maybe. So, okay, this is great. I spoke about a lot of uh, Google studies and uh, maybe a bunch of uh, fluffy things like um, people's persona and inside of the team, but there's a book called Accelerate. Uh, I am aware that this book was uh, written in 2018 uh, and there has been further studies around this going forward, but this one was really relevant uh, because I think what they try and do, or what they, what they achieved to do, was they took, um, again, um, thousands of teams with people, uh, with, with uh, 100,000 people inside of the team, uh, across 100,000 people, across different organizations, different industries, and what they tried to do was they tried to see the influence of uh, engineering culture on uh, an organization's performance, right? Because at the end of the day, the reason why this talk is about why you should care about uh, engineering culture is yes, it makes a nice environment uh, for your organization to work in, but it also drives results. And results are also, uh, a, a lot of the time, it's something that people don't always want to talk about, but it's a, lot, a, lot, a lot of the time, the goal of business is to be successful and to create a, a, a successful environment. So they try to look at how does uh, engineering culture and DevOps specifically, I won't, DevOps is quite a, uh, a loaded term, I think, at the moment, but just in general, the operations of the engineers inside of the teams, uh, what really helps create uh, a good, a good environment for them. So their idea and what they, uh, I'll give you a, a spoiler for the book. You, you're welcome to read it. It's a good book. I would recommend it. Um, and what they really tried to say um, is what does organizational culture affect uh, inside of the business? And they, they found that uh, organization's culture uh, directly influences software delivery performance, right? So if you have a good engineering culture, people are working hard, they're delivering value, they feel energized and empowered and they want to get stuff done, that increases your software delivery performance. Um, and that's, that's, that's important. And then they go a step further and to say that if your software delivery performance uh, is increased, then your organizational performance is, is increased as well. So if you cut out the middleman there, you can see that you could say that organizational culture directly influences organizational performance. So this is what the book tried to say, or 
does say. Um, yeah, I, I won't try and validate or invalidate their research, but they put a lot of time and effort into to looking into this. And I've seen this too. So when I spoke earlier about my experience in working in different countries, um, when you have a really good uh, organizational culture and engineering culture inside of your teams, uh, and you're able to deliver software quickly and to meet clients' needs, uh, to build great services that people are using, to interact with other organizations and other stakeholders in a timely manner to provide value, uh, it makes you feel good as the person who works for that organization, but it also really helps your, your organization's performance. So let me ask you a question again. Uh, what do you think are the characteristics of a good culture? Yeah, what, what, you know, exactly. What, what kind of things would you expect to see inside of a good culture or what kind of characteristics describe a good culture? Yeah, the first thing you want to mention is uh, yeah, happy employees. Yeah, sure. Anyone, you had something else to add? Happy employees. Um, yeah, when, when people speak with each other rather than about each other. Yep. yep. Anyone else? Yeah. Strong uh, engagement, collaboration, creativity, flourishing. Yes, good to hear. Yep. So there is, uh, in the book, they reference this, uh, this person. His name's Westrom. I don't know, has anyone here heard of Westrom before? Uh, Westrom, Westrom describes organizational culture um, and what he basically says in this way uh, is that uh, Westrom's organizational culture starts off with collaboration, uh, like you mentioned. Thank you for, for, for mentioning collaboration. I think generally uh, inside of any team, it doesn't matter if it's software, uh, a football team, for instance, if the, the, play, the people are not working together, then you don't really have a team, you just have a bunch of individuals doing things, and that doesn't really achieve the result. So I think collaboration is always at the heart of a culture. This is more of what you, would like, what you will see uh, inside a, a good cultured company is quality decision making. So that means that uh, I think with quality decision making, people often concern, uh, con, uh, fuse that with making, the, right, uh, uh, making the, the correct decision. You can never really know all the parameters up front for, for making a decision, so you don't know if it's right or wrong before you make it. But if you have a well-informed decision, so you have all the necessary information to make that decision, the higher the chance of making a quality, quality decision. And you could be right, you could be wrong, but I think a quality decision is, is defined by the amount of information that you have up front before making that decision. So here you could discover and, uh, discover and solve problems quickly. So this, again, you would see uh, inside of a team that has uh, a good culture. They find issues. They proactively look to solve problems. If you've been in a, a good engineering team before, you will, you will see that uh, not only do you actively work on clients' problems, but you're also trying to identify and work on the other issues that are inside your team and trying to remove those from your team and trying to solve them. So I think at the heart of, of engineering uh, in general, it, people like to say it's problem solving. I think so too. Uh, I think that... Um, when you are someone who is passionate about engineering, generally you'll find under the hood they really like to solve problems. Maybe this doesn't always work so well. Uh, my wife hates it, by the way, so whenever she comes to me with a problem, the first thing I want to do is solve that problem for her. Does, it, does anyone recognize this? Uh, yeah. <laughs> so I work hard to try and stop doing that because I know that's not always the right, the right solution, but uh, at my heart I'm a, I'm a problem solver. Yeah, sure. Data decision making versus quality. Yeah. I think. So I think data is uh, one part of a quality decision. Uh, I think that it's one of the factors. So not everything is data that you can look at on a screen, for instance. So I think in that way, speaking to other stakeholders, um, collaborating on that decision, I think those things are parts of the quality decision making process. So data is just one aspect, just one aspect of that, I would say, yes. And then, so myself and Rustam, uh, we have uh, augmented this, this model because we feel that there was a missing piece and Google identified this earlier as well. Um, and I think, uh, so, sorry, uh, let me say first this. So success is 20% of the skills and 80% strategy. So you might know how to succeed, but more importantly, what's your plan to succeed, right? So yeah, you know all the things you need to be doing, but how do you get there? And how do the people inside of your team, how do they know how to get there? So that brings us to the shared vision and mission. So 
uh, my, my colleagues from CVA earlier also mentioned this, right? Having a vision is really important. If you look at uh, a lot of the literature around this, uh, people really like to identify with something. They like to buy into a company. Uh, and when they buy into the company, they have a strong passion for delivering. And I think that's the shared vision and mission. And if you looked at Google's, like I said, the first last three pieces where they had structure of work, meaning of work, and impact of work, I would say that plays strongly into shared vision and mission as well. Yes. So I think Westrom uh, described um, organizational culture as, as this. So this would be the generic version for uh, organizations in general. You would see this, you see this in law firms, you would see this in a lot of other places. Uh, but I think what's truly different uh, when it comes to engineering is, is what I mentioned earlier, uh, is really about the shared vision and mission. So this piece is what turns a good or a great organizational culture into a great engineering culture, is the ability uh, to work on things that are meaningful, to have a, a shared goal that you want to achieve. I think that really brings engineering together. Because if you have a bunch of uh, problem solvers inside of your team, but they're all solving different problems, then maybe you're not really on the right track to achieve what you want. So I think in that way, having people uh, dedicated to work on the vision and mission, and as my colleague said, not telling them what to do, just saying this is where we need to go, how they get there is up to them, I think is a, a really important part of, of engineering culture. Yeah. Okay, so maybe we can all agree now that uh, culture is important and that we should focus on it. Uh, maybe not, we can talk about that afterwards if you like to. But uh, if we agree on that, then I think the, the next point to talk for us is um, how do we change culture? And John Shook mentions that the way to change culture is not first change how people think, but instead to change how people behave, right? So how do we really want to see that cultural change in our organization? Well, we need to look at not telling... Uh, uh, engineering culture or culture in a company is not a bunch of things written on a, on a whiteboard or on a, on a sticky note or on a poster that you put up nicely in your, your cafeteria. It's, it has an effect, of course, but if no one is ex uh, behaving in a way that abides by those values, then it's just a, a bunch of meaningless writing on a wall. So behavior is what truly makes uh, culture. Then I would ask, uh, again, what behavior do you think influences a good engineering culture? Yeah? Yeah, lead by example, right? By example, yeah, good one. Yeah, anyone else? A growth, a growth mindset, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, very valuable too. Anyone else? Just do stuff. Just do stuff. Yeah, I like that too. Yeah, indeed. So again, I'll refer back to uh, the literature that I mentioned just now. Um, and what does the research say about this? Well, the first one, this was a book obviously a lot about DevOps, and you'll hear something called continuous delivery. So who here knows what continuous delivery is? Okay, uh, and a half. So I'll give a quick uh, basic introduction uh, to what this means. And it's about how your software gets, um, how fast and how easy and how um, the ability of your engineers to be able to work at any time, to not have any blockers in getting the software to um, the end state or to the production or to the, the end user. So it's really about can you deliver software and changes and updates and bug fixes and whatever else you can think about, new features, how quick and easy it is for your engineers to get that um, to, to the production state. So that's really one of the, the main things that speaks about continuous delivery. Um, and in good organizations, you'll find that having your engineers working on business value, uh, maybe you guys have heard about platform teams. Anyone heard about platform teams at the moment? Yeah, platform teams, they're, they're kind of like the new buzzword in, in, in the leadership space, I think, in almost every talk you hear about them. I won't specifically talk about platform teams, but the main idea around platform teams is also to do with continuous delivery because what they do is they allow the engineers to work on the business value. So they're the ones that need to put into production the, the request or the needs of the user. The other stuff around that, getting the software deployed, uh, building security, uh, building databases, all that kind of stuff is taken care of for them so they can truly focus on delivering business value. 
Uh, and that's really important because when you're an engineer, you, you get the most satisfaction from actually building value. Again, as, as Google said, building value is, is very important. Um, and continuous delivery is a, a good way. And the, the behaviors in continuous delivery really help uh, achieve that inside of your organization. So the next one, and we heard this in the beginning, is lean management. So I think, uh, who, who knows about lean management? Most people, I think, right? It's not a new concept. Um, but basically, the, the three parts that I like to look at inside of lean management, the first one is uh, creating value or identifying value, then the flow, right, creating and, and, and moving that, uh, and then um, pursuing perfection, which I don't really like because I think perfection is something that uh, is not really the best word to use. But I think in, in terms of what that means is you're always looking to do better, to build better, and to become better. And I think that that uh, iterative process of becoming better is important. So I think that these behaviors um, inside of engineering culture are really important as well, right? You don't want to spend too much time uh, working on meetings. Again, you want to be working on, on business value. So you really want to be looking at the, the lean management principles um, for that. So this is an engineering culture. This is what you would see in a lot of organizations already. Most people are probably doing some piece or all of this. Do you guys recognize, recognize this in your organizations at the moment? Okay, so then we see this, but then what, how do we go from just an engineering culture to a, a great engineering culture, right? So what do you got? Anyone would like to chime in again with some, some ideas about how you can go from a good culture to a great culture? What is missing from lean management and continuous delivery that you think would take it to the next level? Good one. So innovation days, those are really nice. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone else? Continuous improvement. Yeah. Also good. True. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, hold on. I want to say one more thing about the continuous delivery, by the way, that uh, everyone's heard about burnout. Uh, a lot of people are probably experiencing burnout post COVID. I think this, personally, I feel that there's more people that I know now on burnout than I've ever seen before. Um, and actually, uh, continuous delivery by the book standards proves that uh, if you can make your delivery process smooth for your engineers, you can actually reduce the risk of burnout. So that's something to note. Um, sorry, back to this point. Uh, <laughs> I just really wanted to say that. Um, so how can you go from a good culture to a great culture? Uh, we've already mentioned, someone mentioned this before already, but, and CBI has also really, uh, um, and my colleagues mentioned this earlier as well, uh, knowledge sharing. Right, so you mentioned innovation days. Innovation days is, a, is something that you would do inside of a knowledge sharing environment, uh, and this would really be something that um, adds to going from a good culture to a great culture. Um, so if I uh, add one more, again, the red is something that we added, and we think that this. So the book basically spoke about continuous delivery and lean management, but we also thought we also really, really truly believe uh, that knowledge exchange is the, is a vital piece. Um, of a great engineering culture. So, let me ask another question. Who here in their organization is doing something about knowledge sharing? Good. Uh, what, do you, what do you guys do for knowledge sharing? Good to hear. Yeah. Anyone else over there? Want to share? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we have a general uh, day where we can show what we learned and uh, we can share and analysis with this uh, with the community. Oh, nice. Yeah. Cool. Anyone else want to share? Okay. So a lot of us are already doing things about knowledge sharing, but there's always more that we could be doing, and maybe some people aren't doing some knowledge sharing and would like to get started. So I have uh, prepared what I would call a recipe for success when it comes to knowledge exchange. Um, and the first point being preheat the leadership. So you mentioned this earlier, lead by example, right? So if you want uh, a knowledge exchange or knowledge sharing culture inside of your organization, it has to start from, the, it has to start from leadership. You can't expect uh, it to come from anyone else. You really need to be the ones that um, lead the company into 
the knowledge exchange culture. The next one would be slice in some space safe spaces. Um, do you have, um, again, place for people to fail? Do you have that psychological safety inside of your teams? Do you have the spaces where people can go free and create uh, the content that they need? Do you, do you allow for that? Do you really have that kind of space inside of your organization where there's experimentation? So I hear things about experimentation. Do you allow for that? Do you have, have, are you actively, it's not even do you allow for that, but are you actively creating the environment uh, that allows for those safe spaces to be, to be used? Mix in the experts. So we all know uh, the expert on something in your organization, right? The shopping cart guy or the, um, the, back, the, the database guy. Everyone knows who to speak to about a certain technology or a certain piece of the domain or a certain uh, feature that the website has, for example. But are they sharing that knowledge? Or are they really just the guy that everyone goes to talk to and that knowledge is not shared with inside your organi organization? Could you maybe go speak to that person and say, hey, We've realized that you're the, 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 the shopping cart guy. Can you give a talk about what makes a shopping cart? What's the journey about the shopping cart? How did we get here? Can we share that with inside the team, right? And that's an easy way to pick someone to say, how can we, no, one, no one's starting to share knowledge, but how can we just pick someone or empower someone to share that knowledge, right? That's an easy person to pick is, is one of the experts. The next one is, is there an incentive? So when it comes to... Um, knowledge sharing, not everyone is going to start off walking into work, okay, we have an engineering, we have a great uh, knowledge sharing culture, and wow, I want to share all my knowledge, right? People do sometimes need a little bit of incentive to get, to get going, to get started. So are you trying to incentivize uh, knowledge sharing? What are you doing about that? Are you making programs where people can share? Maybe you've elected the expert, but he says, hey, look, I've got all these new features, and I've got to see my wife on the weekend. Like, are you, are you trying to make it easy for him to share knowledge or are you just trying to say, hey, go share the knowledge and then you're leaving it at that, right? What incentive does he have to actually want to do that? You have to make sure you think about that. There's lots of incentive, incentivization uh, tactics that you, can, that, that you can use. I won't go into those now. Again, collaboration, right? So sh that's why uh, me and Rustam did this talk together because we felt that uh, collaborating on, on, a, on a talk that speaks a lot about collaboration is probably a good idea. He's uh, on holiday right now, so he, he couldn't be here with me. Um, so at least we shared the knowledge so I can give the talk while he's not here too, right? So that's a, that's a good factor. Um, but definitely sprinkle in the collaboration. Uh, work together with people. Create um, environments where people feel free to collaborate together to share that knowledge. Maybe uh, an innovation day is a good idea where people work on a specific project. Or maybe you have, a, you have a website and you're moving to the cloud. So I see examples a lot where people are moving from an on-premise situation to a cloud environment. Are you experimenting with the features that the cloud offers or are you really just lifting your offerings and putting them into a new place and not really getting any benefit out of that? Maybe you could have a day where you explore the, the new features that you could get from moving to a new environment. That's, and you could work with your engineers to do that together. And I mentioned this already, but I think it's really important to re reduce the barrier of entry. So if you have a lot of processes or anything that someone has to do in order to share the knowledge, that's going to uh, negatively affect their experience, uh, and maybe they're not, they're not going to want to share knowledge anymore. So are you really making sure that the barrier of entry for knowledge exchange is as low as possible? And are you doing something about that? So these are the, the recipe for success that you could take home today and, and start doing uh, to create a good knowledge exchange. And now I'll just point out the, the, full, the full picture of what I spoke about now. So continuous delivery, knowledge exchange, lean management, and then with inside of your teams, you get collaboration, discover problems quickly, quality decision making, but make sure that you have that shared vision and mission. And then hopefully, uh, like these people, the, the new culture is your, is your savior, uh, and uh, your team start going in a really good way. <coughs> Yeah, thanks AI for the really good images, I must say. I'm, I'm really impressed with, uh, I don't know anyone else, but I'm really impressed with AI's ability to make cool images. I'm not very, uh, I've always wanted to be very artistic, but I'm not very artistic, I'm more mathematically inclined. So this really helps. Well, yep, and well, that's it. <laughs>